This month's How I Spin will take a slightly different format and will be a larger reflection of what we explored this year. We did so much this year that I think it's important to take a moment and pause to reflect on all of that. As important as it is to keep moving forward and building, learning and exploring, it's also important to take a moment to look back and remember what we've accomplished. grew a lot this past year and you all welcomed in so many new people with open arms. I've watched many develop friendships with one another, making plans to get together, fostering a love of making yarn with one another. Every day I wake up to many new photos of projects being loaded into Slack. It's just incredible. Some people have messaged me to let me know that they had to turn off notifications so that they could just check in once a day. Otherwise they were always on it, checking and responding to everything because it's so busy. I totally get that. In that vein, I'd like to take this time to share with you many of the things we learned this year, things going on in other parts of the community and more. As we look forward to 2022, we will be celebrating an amazing six years on Patreon. This community is more than just a podcast community. It's a maker community of incredible people. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my toes for your participation here. So let's get started. This year has been filled with many ups and downs for all. There have been surprising moments, hurtful moments, heartfelt moments, and so much more. Throughout the pandemic, we've weathered a major storm of ups and downs. Everyone has experienced a death, a funeral, a wedding, a birth, and so much more. We've been separated and also brought closer throughout this trying time. The world will not return to the normal we remember be from before, but instead we will emerge into a new world. Some will make many choices after much reflection about what went well in the last two years and make strategic changes to their lives to live more intentionally. Some will jump right back in, missing so deeply the friendships and connections that have been largely missing. Others will be more cautious, taking time to navigate this new landscape of opening. And still others will take a middle ground and be somewhere in between. Each of us has to figure out what our path forward and throughout all of this will be. We've had this amazing chance to come together and to make things throughout this time. Instinctual to clothe ourselves and our families from cold and outside elements, we seem to be drawn into this place of wanting to create and make with our hands. I often feel that it's more of a calling than a pastime. This is so ingrained in what our ancestors did with much of their lives outside of foraging for food and caring for babies and children. Much of their lives were spent telling stories, finding food, caring for and feeding children, and making clothing. If anyone in the community hasn't read Sapiens, I would highly recommend that book to anyone as he discusses the simplicity with which many gatherer hunter tribes lived much more simply, he asserts, than the cultures centered around agriculture that came later. This year, our book club read and discussed Empire of Cotton, which took us on a winding road of culture, creating cloth, racism and colonialism expropriation of lands by force and violence around the world, capitalism, and so much more. We also explored the beauty and heartbreaking book There There by Tommy Orange. It was a multi-narrator story broken into parts that chronicles lives of First Nations living in Oklahoma, California, as they all make their way to a powwow. We discussed many topics related to that book, sharing stories and ideas that sp were sparked from the heartbreaking stories shared within the book. We all enjoyed it immensely and the discussions from that book were deep, thoughtful, respectful, and educating. I am continuing to enjoy the group discussions and I'm looking forward to the books we have chosen for the new year. 
Our year of luxury completely got out of control with the amount of learning and content that we explored. We started off with just an incredible amount of spinning and sampling with our wild silk study that soon pivoted to mulberry and tussa silk. Many of the silks are just referred to as tussa as they are if they are non mulberry, which I know many find confusing. Many of the wild silk moths are descendants of the original tussa silk moths. Therefore, many of the silk blends and fibers out there are just labeled tussa if it is not from cultivated bombix or mulberry silk. From there, we explored cashmere. Several fibers that we explored this year were new to us fibers that we hadn't previously explored. I thought this was wonderful because not only does it push me as a spinner to speak to these fibers, but I get to explore many different ways and approaches of spinning these fibers. I've never been a spinner to come to a fiber and spin the same way over and over, but this year really pushed me outside the box of spinning which is a nice jumping point from our 51 yarns exploration that we did from 2019 to 2020 that finished off with spinning outside the box. This really just means to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. If you are putting together a spinning portfolio, this is a great way to do it. Continue to sample and spin, keeping those samples, ideas and reflections, continuing to add to it as you go and chronicling your learning. The key is to constantly push yourself outside your comfort zone and your perceived level. Think you can't spin something? Give it a try. Just like someone in our community spinning mint fiber and coming to the community with questions about how to continue to get better as she becomes a more experienced spinner. Cashmere, Kiviet, Yak and Camel and Pygora were the fibers that we've never explored in our community before. That is a ton. I had actually thought we'd explore many of those fibers in our 51 yarn spin along from the last several years. But as I was looking through these fibers that could be considered luxury, I realized we still had many, many more to explore. And we still have more to do. Some of the things I learned about spinning these fibers since I tried to spin larger quantities of them included, but are certainly not limited to some of the following. Non-wool fibers, fill a much needed niche in our spinning repertoire to give us more to think about when, as we plan projects, including blends and interesting textures, colors, and features. Many of these fibers need a lot more twist than most wools. So having access to higher ratios and while not necessary can be really, really helpful. Many of these fibers are quite strong and durable in a different way from wool fibers, but with no scales to help them hold together, they still need twist, but not so much as to become wiry and stiff. Most are double or triple coated, so de-herring and preparation time needs to be taken into account. Different spinning drafts are often needed to handle the sometimes really slippery or short stapled fiber. I had to think outside the box about how to approach many of these fibers. And finally, my favorite yarns I spun this year included the wool luxury blends and the most surprising was the Merino Kiviet blend that completely blew me away. Our year of luxury could perceivably go into another year of exploration, revisiting many of the fibers we've already done, but with a different twist and also including new ones. There is no end of opportunity to explore in the world of spinning. Share, sharing my findings with you all in mini workshops each month is a great way to continue pushing ourselves and learning so much more from each other. Each month we explore another new topic and discuss the learning, samplings and findings. This comes in two formats, both vlogged and PDF, and in two different courses, if you will, including the Spinning Pearls and How I Spin. Spin Pearls and the Thoughtful Spinner are the monthly teaching content and the downloadable PDF that accompanies, while How I Spin goes into more detail and takes the topic deeper. These two tiers have been this way for several years now. As we move forward into the new year, I have continued to simplify the Patreon tiers for usability and ease of navigation. I don't have more to share now, but over the coming year, I'm going to be making ongoing changes to allow the content creation to continue to grow and expand. If there is something in particular that you are looking for, whether more spinning groups online in real time or content creation, please let me know in the comments associated with this Patreon post. 
it's really helpful for me to know what you are looking for. Would you like these vlogs to be released as premieres so that there is a live chat and you can ask questions in the moment? They would then be made unlisted for you to reference later. Would you like more live stream content? Please let me know. More importantly, what are your spinning goals for the coming year and how can I support and help you with them? Is there something in particular you are looking to learn and explore? Is there something out there that you wish is, would be a resource but doesn't exist yet? Would I be able to create that for you? So let me know. I'm open to ideas and thoughts. Would love to hear what you are thinking about and how you see your making in the coming year. Twice per year in January and again in July, we have our dyer in residence, the very talented Katrina Stewart, create our breeding color study. I can't say enough amazing things about my dear friend, and you all know her from being on Wool and Spinning Radio, sharing her own reflections about her making, creating breeding color studies, and more. Some of you have had the pleasure of meeting her in person through Knit City and Fibers West, which are the local to me festivals here in the greater Vancouver area of British Columbia, Canada. Every six months, we explore a breed of wool and color theory. Katrina is a color genius, and it's amazing to see how her mind works as she puts together inspiration for our community. In the first part of the year, we explore comb top, and then in the second half of the year, we explore carded fibers. This past year, Katrina outdid herself with our Shetland study, which she based on one of her own photographs, naming the study Always Believe. The community came together to spin those braids in so many ways, it was absolutely mind-boggling. Many finished projects that included a lot of knitting or weaving were shared. We've had a real weaving surgence going on in the community this year with many starting their Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Master Weaver Certificate. As we grow and learn together, we become more and more knowledgeable and are able to continue to support others in their learning journey. It's amazing and awesome to see and witness. The workmanship that came out of the Shetland study was absolutely amazing with many garments knit and finished, modeled and shared. I had the immense pleasure of featuring many of them on the podcast during the live stream each week, which was so incredibly cool for me. Thank you for taking the time to photograph your projects and share your learning. The Shetland study was a great opportunity for me to spin a larger quantity of yarn to knit into the spark cardigan by Andrea Mowry that I had been dreaming about. The Murat braid was by far my favorite of the three, and I wanted to spin it end to end for the backbone of the fractal. The gray was divided, I think, four times, and the white was divided several more to create a three-ply fractal of each braid. Against the tawny brown of the CVM that I chose for the background color, I ended up with a timeless cardigan that I know I will wear and wear and wear for years to come. I didn't have much opportunity to wear it in the spring as the weather warmed, but the few times that I was able to, I felt I was wrapped in a huge hug and it was so perfect. From there, we moved into the Jacob study with the amazing colors that Katrina created from her own mind. She was having a lot of fun and had hoped to shine some light and joy into each of our lives with her color choices. After many had had such a challenging year, she saw it as an opportunity to brighten everyone's mailboxes. Mission accomplished. This was one of those studies that people started spinning immediately. Some started spinning before they'd even received the fiber, I swear. Some had it spun the same day that they received it, which was so awesome. So selfishly, this is also a chance for me to discuss some of my own personal projects this year. There weren't nearly as many sweaters as there were last year, and I made a conscious effort to knit from stash this year to begin using up yarn that, that's been hanging out for a long time. I finished off 2020 and started 2021 by working on Marmore by Regina Mossamore. Mossmore. This was from Reclaimed Yarn from My Fireside by Jane Richmond that I had knit from a CVM Suffolk Meat Merino blend from a local shepherdess. This is not a soft yarn. It was woolen spun using long draw back in 2016 and the hand feel of the yarn was never great, even after knitting. I ripped out the sweater and scoured the yarn again and bingo. It still had some lanolin in the finished yarn so knitting with it the second time was a bit more enjoyable. I also didn't knit it as tightly as I had previously. 
If I were to knit this again, I would modify the back neck to include fewer stitches as the contiguous method of creating the yoke was slightly too wide for my shoulders. I love this sweater and actually wore it quite a bit, so I would definitely think about knitting this again in the future. From there, I finished off Poet by Sorry Nordland. It was an absolute marathon. I'd started this in July of 2020 and kept knitting it throughout the fall and the winter. While I'm happy with the finished sweater, I'm actually quite surprised at the fact that I haven't actually worn it. The summer was so hot this year that the last thing I wanted to do was put on a wool-based sweater, even though it was super wash and it isn't warm per se. It just didn't do it for me. And as we enter a new year and look forward to spring, I will actively find places to wear it and showcase all of that work. None of my knitting and just general projects this year felt quite right, if that makes sense. Coming off the two years that I had experienced in my personal life, as well as the global pandemic, uh, all co compounded to a very gentle year in the making space. I didn't push myself to make really big projects or get a lot done. I constantly reminding myself that it'll get done when I get to it and letting most everything else go. It was very freeing in my making, to be honest. Shifty by Andrea Mowry ended up being a bit like this. It didn't come together exactly as I had envisioned. And I've thought about ripping back and redoing the body of the sweater, which we talked about on episode 2218, I think. The blue seemed too loud and I wasn't sure where to go with it. I had added short rows at the back lower hem to enhance fit, which I really liked, but overall the sweater was a bit of a disappointment for me, even though I'd hoped and wanted to make it for so long. This is absolutely a project I will come back to in the future. And if you are thinking about making this sweater, there are a few things to think about. The contrast colors don't take as much yarn as you would think, even in mine where I lengthened the body. The main color is also quite sparse. I was really surprised. It would be absolutely realistic to spin a braid of each color for each contrast color at a sport weight, so roughly about 14 wraps per inch, and have more than enough yardage for many of the sizes. This is great because we all have those braids in our stash that would look great together and we'd be able to do a bit of stash busting. Again, I am still really tempted to make this again in a cardigan version with steaking. I just love the those modifications on Ravelry that people have made. I think they're really cute and just like this, it's just like the stone crop cardigan. It's just so great. As we have mentioned earlier in this blog, we spent quite a bit of time this year on our breeding color study on Shetland. The main yarn that I'd made was a three ply fractal using the moret as the background and then the gray was broken and the white was further broken to create that three ply. As many of you know, I absolutely love fractals and they just make my heart sing. With the yardage that I was able to create, I ended up using it as contrast color in The Spark by Andrea Maori, as I've mentioned. But this ended up being my magnum opus this year and was probably my favorite project of the whole year. I used my CVM that Liz of Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks processed for me and my friend Greta as the main color. Lots of spinning to end up with the exact yardage that I needed for the sweater was the answer for me and I spun only what I needed for the sweater. I learned a couple of things about this project, including reminding myself how much I enjoy steaking so that I'm able to knit in the round. One of the other learnings was the fact that I absolutely love three ply, three ply yarns. They are just awesome to knit with and they create such an incredibly pleasing fabric at the end. Throughout the spring, I worked on a cardigan by one of my favorite designers, Fennel by Orlean Souche. This spin was crazy. It was that massive bat that was probably meant for commercial applications like batting. It was a carded Romney from Disdero Ranch in Tappan, British Columbia, Canada. Untying this bat and getting into the spinning was really fun, but it was different. I enjoyed this because of that and even included it in the Spinning Sheep Breeds workshop over on the School of Sweet Georgia. Working with a longer stapled wool in a woolen preparation was definitely challenging. And then knitting it into this cardigan had its own challenges as well. The stitches from this wool are never going to lay absolutely perfectly, which we are so used to in our knitting due to the types of wools that we tend to work with mostly. Also, the curling at the bottom hem is quite substantial. Would I rip this? Probably not. This yarn is very grabby and even the places in the sweater where I made mistakes were really hard to rip. 
It's also very toothy. It's been hard to wear and I'm pretty wool tolerant, so that's pretty significant for me. Throughout the summer, I worked on the Florence Tank, another design by Sar Sari Nordland. I was so excited about this sweater and it ended up being a bit of a bummer. The front of the sweater and the racer back to the tank was hard to finish nicely. All of these things contributed to a bit of a wah wah project. The yarn needed to be a bit thicker, slightly more lofty, and this commercial yarn was just too thin and it was too fine. The sweater needed a bit more bulk in the hand of the yarn and it's going to end it's being held double. So think about a yarn that makes a really good solid DK weight when it's held double, not a light sport like what happened to me. Oh, Magnolia Bloom, another project that had the potential to be a real bummer. This design by Camilla Vad uh, features a great lace yoke. The neckline was a bit too tight, so I modified the neckline rather than the two by two rib called for in the pattern. The body of the sweater was a perfect fit and the sleeves were really worrisome. The arm side was too big and I was quite concerned. In the end, I abandoned the body and picked up the sleeves to see if it was worthwhile to keep going or to rip the whole thing out. This yarn is quite dense. It's a very firmly spun CVM four ply from Custom Woolen Mills in Alberta. It's meant to be a sturdy yarn. A hardy sweater ended up being a great option, but going back and trying to figure out those sleeves was needed. In the end, some very quick decreases worked beautifully, and this is by far one of my favorite sweaters. It is going to get worn a lot. That's a lot of sweater knitting. I'm actually really surprised that I made so many sweaters. I'm actually shocked to be honest. That's why a reflection on projects and decisions throughout the year is really important. Taking a moment to share and reflect helps you to see where, where you've been, what you've created and learned, and where you want to go from here. What I really enjoy hearing about is what really surprised you in your making as you approached your spinning, your finished yarns and your completed projects. It's a lot of the reason behind continuing the zero to do zero to hero year after year. The Ravelry thread for Zero to Hero is in the Ravelry group and the challenge is to take the year to spin fiber into yarn and then to knit or weave or whatever you do into a finished item. Going through that process is really important. So continuing to work on something and sharing it with others helps you to grow. As I've waxed poetic throughout this month's How I Spin vlog, you've been waiting so patiently for me to map out next year's content. Thank you for sticking with me. I'm excited about it and I hope you will be as well. Here's how things will break down for the year ahead. As we've laid out in the past, Spinning Pearls will offer our monthly teaching content. Spinning Pearls is the vlog format, while our co-executive producers receive the additional PDF with photos, resources, and inspiration. Each month I release content that I have worked really hard on, and I want to share it with you guys, but with Patreon posts and indexes to attempt to keep things organized. Things do tend sometimes get lost. Because of that, I will be adding an extra live stream for our Wool Circle members. We already meet bi-monthly to discuss sampling and in the moment spinning, but now we will meet a third time to be able to walk through what's got me excited about the month's focus, the yarns I've spun, and the fibers I've worked with. And it'll be an overview of what to expect in Spinning Pearls. I hope that this extra conversation is helpful to you as we navigate our spinning content each month and this might even encourage you to get spinning on it rather than just watching and reading each month. Think of it as a little more hand holding. But what will we be studying? I'm so glad you asked. I've broken the year up into four chunks of between two to three months consisting of winter, spring, summer, and fall. We will start the year off with a two month exploration of yarn consistency. This is content that we have explored in the past. And you might be thinking, really Rachel, we've done that. You're absolutely right, we have. But there are many in our community who are new to the community and, are sp and just new to spinning in general. It's important to look at some of these fundamentals every so often to really understand the yarns that we are making. I'm calling it level two because we will be looking specifically at twist per inch and plying. This will be a deep dive into creating intentional yarns like we've done in the past, but this time with some charts and some math. So to the mathematicians and the teachers out there, you're welcome. 
After that, we will pivot to flax in the spring. I had the wonderful opportunity to explore flax spinning for the Ontario hand weavers and spinners in the spring of 2021. I found this exploration fascinating and wanted to share some of my own learning with you. This will be a three month study, including some history around flax spinning, planting and preparation, preparing a distaff for spinning flax, wet spinning, and finally we will delve into how to actually use these yarns in our weaving. For the summer, we will do something we haven't really done before and we will spend the summer exploring cotton. We've looked at cotton in the past and it was very limited and we only spent about a month on it. This will be a three month deep dive into preparing raw cotton, spinning from cotton poonies, and then finally spinning from prepared cotton. I'm really excited to embark on this exploration with you guys and I am still working on that particular exploration so I'm not exactly sure how it's going to roll out. Lastly, our breeding color studies are such an integral part of what we do in our community each year. I've set aside the winter to look at both our combed and carded study, which will be offered together this year. This is a major change to how we've done things in the past. We will look at the spinning and color management and then move on to projects that I've made with the yarns. The final month of the year will be spent on some reflections from the year, including how my Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Master Weaver explorations are going, as well as some highlights from the year. If there is anything that you would like to see in particular, please comment on the Patreon post so that others can chime in as well. Where are you at in your spinning journey and what seems to be popping up for you in your learning that you'd like to focus on? In the community, what are you seeking most? Please share so that we can continue to build this amazing place. As always, share your findings with us either on the Slack channel under hashtag general or in the Ravelry group. Be sure to share your projects, your spins and your makes using hashtag wool and spinning so that others in the community can see your progress. And don't hesitate to tag me so that I can see your stuff as well. Until next time, happy spinning and a very happy new year. Bye everyone.